Morning, everybody. Um, first of all, a little bit of housekeeping. My name is uh, Dom Hallis. I'm the executive director of, of CODEC, or the Coalition for a Digital Economy. Um, <laughs> we're delighted to have a, an amazing panel here for you today, but just a quick bit of housekeeping. First of all, could everybody um, mute themselves um, so that A, we can, we can hear the panel. Um, uh, we will take questions a little bit later. We'll take them through, through the chat function. Um, and, and make sure that we're, we, we can sort of see the speakers as they're, as they're speaking is the main priority and we don't get a, an awful lot of background noise. Um, as, as I said, we have an awesome panel for you here today to talk about the, the startup support packages through COVID-19, both in terms of the support from the government and also hopefully a little bit of, of, of what else is out there. Um, and the start of this conversation, we're delighted to have uh, John Glenn, the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, uh, who has been doing an awesome job at, at Treasury working through some of the startup support packages. And I, I know that because he's had the misfortune of speaking to me on multiple occasions so far <laughs> over the course of the last two months. So, um, uh, John, I'll, I'll start with you um, and then I'll introduce our panel a little bit later. We'll have a, just so in terms of format, so people know, um, I'm going to ask John a few questions. John will speak a little bit um, and then we'll introduce the panel to have a broader discussion and take some of your questions as well. Um, so, John, uh, over to you. What's been what's been going on? What's yeah, yeah, available? Yeah. 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 Um, and a reminder, please, could people mute their uh, mute um, stuff so that we can hear everybody? Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Dom, and um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be uh, on this uh, webinar again and to engage with this very, very important uh, community and also to address some of the real challenges that you face at this time. <clears throat> obviously, these are extraordinary times, and obviously this is um, London Tech Week. I would have uh, joined many of you in person, um, but I want to address some of the things that we've done uh, as a government over recent weeks, um, but also just remind ourselves of you know, how critical the technology uh, sector is in the UK. Um, last year, we grew six times faster than the UK economy as a whole, um, and the UK is the, is the third uh, uh, nation in terms of um, tech unicorns. Um, we have 77 companies uh, valued at over uh, the, the, the 1 billion unicorn mark. So um, in terms of the government support, we've obviously put a massive uh, set of interventions in place across the economy. Um, and prior to the uh, pandemic, um, we put two and a half billion pounds into the um, British Patient Capital Fund, which is the, the I think, generally acknowledged to be an, an internationally competitive uh, uh, R&D uh, venture capital um, tax reliefs uh, environment as well. Um, and then obviously in the budget, uh, I think on the 11th of March, we um, set out the uh, increase, the phenomenal increase in R&D spending to 22 billion by 24 25. Now, given the context, it's really important that we continue to look at what we can do for the tech sector. And so in addition to the um, job retention scheme, um, the C-bills loans, the banks back loans, and the self-employment income support scheme, we introduced a range of measures. And the first part of that was the 750 million of grants and loans for SMEs focusing on R&D. Those were primarily administered through uh, Innovate UK. Uh, 200 million of that will support Innovate UK to sort of give support on a monthly basis to help with cash flow. And then we have an additional 550 million allocated through um, existing programs, um, which obviously take on a greater significance in, in this context. Um, and then we had 40 million will go towards new grants through the fast response scheme that we opened just two months ago on the 3rd of April. And, you know, obviously I would encourage everyone to look at Innovate's um, uh, gov.uk page for more details of those. And then obviously we have the Future Fund as well. Um, and the Chancellor, you know, took a massive his key role uh, from the start in designing that. Um, and that is about, you know, helping businesses that were finding equity investments difficult to um, sustain in this environment. Um, so it provides convertible loan notes worth between 125,000 uh, and 5 million based on uh, achieving quarter of a million of funding over the last five years. Um, so again, that's uh, British Business Bank's website will um, give you more details of that. 
And so far we've seen huge interest. We've had 515 million pounds worth of applications in the first 24 hours. Um, and I think we've now seen as of um, uh, Sunday, uh, 533 applications from a broad range of companies and sectors. So um, the first of those have now been approved. First of those loans have been approved. Um, and you know we are we though we initially um, allocated 250 million to the future fund, we'll be you know continuing to keep that under review. I'm acutely conscious, uh, and I have been since the early conversations I've had uh, with you, Dom, and others uh, from the sector about the diversity and regional uh, concerns. Um, you know, I think that there was a concern around this supporting the usual suspects and. You know, we are really committed to wanting investors uh, and founders of all genders, ethnicities and regions across the UK to benefit. Um, I, I think it's always going to be challenging in an emergency intervention to address those as fully as we would like. Um, and obviously, we, I'm conscious of my um, colleague, former colleague, Rob Jenrick, now the, the housing secretary who worked with Alison Rose previously. And many of those uh, on, on the um, investing in women code and the future fund is a signatory of the code and, and many of those that have, have put forward uh, applications are obviously signatories as well so I, I, i'm really uh, clear going forward uh, your sector will be key to the recovery and we've got to continue to look tactically at what interventions we can make how we can make the schemes that we've introduced work well um, and you know, I'm looking forward to this discussion to you know take on your questions and to take on your feedback as I work with the Chancellor at you know future of fiscal events this year to you know actually create a, a context for continued growth and prosperity in in a world leading sector in the UK. Thanks so much, John. That's a, a really great introduction, and I wanted to pick up quickly on. Uh, the really pertinent topic, and I'm glad you glad you raised it about diversity and and, and mm. accessibility of the schemes. Um, you talked a, a little bit about about thinking about the design and making sure that people yep. are able to access it, which is great. Um, are we measuring? Uh, you know, what data is going to be coming out of the BBB in terms of who will be able to access the fund? Like we've seen the initial tranche of information, and that 55 million, I think, of the the uh, the money has been distributed but you know mm. we're, we're very conscious that you can't improve what you can't measure and so it's like do we mm. know where that money is going and how are we tracking that effectively and making sure that we can show mm. okay this is the kind of companies that are getting money and how we would we encourage others to get it in the future well we we are looking at that i am not sort of absolutely sure exactly how we're going to um present that data um, but what I can say is that if I look at the broad um, numbers so far um, we're seeing that um, you know there there is a you know it, it is uh, representative of the of the proportions that we would expect and you know if I look at the fast response competition which I mentioned earlier um, we're seeing a higher percentage of applications there from uh, women and there does seem to be a good geographic spread. So I think that's a, a challenge for us to continue to deal with. What we're trying to do at the moment is make sure that we process these applications as quickly as possible. And you know, we will keep it under constant review about how we do that. I'm certainly speaking to um, industry figures about how we would um, develop a more um, targeted program whilst also holding true to the principles of the scheme. Um, but that's something that we will make further announcements in due course, I'm sure. Um, and just talk to me a little bit about, so we've, we talked about the Future Fund and we know, and, and you know from our conversations that there mm -hmm. is a challenge around accessibility for companies at the bottom end. And that ties into the diversity question, but mm -hmm. actually it's a question of its own, which is um, what is out there for uh, super early stage tech companies that might be, uh, you know, in co-working spaces. So, you know, could they access the small business grant scheme that's been extended? But, you know, how how exactly would that work? And then, you know, mm. or they, if they can't access the fund, where where can they go for cash through this period? Like, what what mm. do you think would is are the best places for them? You know, if you're if you're an early stage tech startup on this call and you know that the future fund isn't for you, what is the thing for you? Well, I think it's important to. Um, you know, I mean, over my career before I became a politician, advising companies and also investing in, in tech companies, that you know we are uh, in a it is a, a strong um, uh, part of our economy, and we you know continue to want to 
you know, look at the EIS and the SEIS um, tax schemes, the, the R&D tax credits and startup loans. I mentioned the, the, the significant increase uh, in terms of the expanding of uh, public R&D investment, which all sets the context for you know, a favourable environment for investment. Um, you know, I've gone through and I won't repeat myself the interventions we made with the Future Fund and the Innovate UK interventions. I mean, obviously, bounce back loans are also self certifying and something that can allow people a short term cash flow injection. Um, you know, we consciously did put the limit at 250,000 previous investment over the previous five years as a you know, balancing agent against you know, the, the, the risk to the taxpayer. Um, and, you know, th that that was something that, that we felt was appropriate to do. But I mean, what, what, I'd, what I'd say is that, you know, it's widely reported that, you know, we're obviously going to have to make other interventions later in the year. So the question is, what can we augment to our existing, you know, positive framework and opportunities for in, in, um, incentives for investment? To, um, and that's something that we will, you know, look at. And I will be looking at very carefully with the Chancellor as we approach those fiscal events later this year. And so we've talked a little bit about um, the kind of direct support for, for tech companies. One of the things we're super conscious of at, at Codec is the, the support of communities that goes around that. So whether that's the co-working spaces they exist in, whether that's local community groups that have seen their, their revenues hit. Is there the potential as part of the, the future conversations around fiscal events or whatever to look at that broader community aspect and understand how we can facilitate and help grow, particularly in, in the regions where we know that the, the sort of revenue generation from events and stuff is really really important for those ecosystems mm. do we see potential progress being made there well i think the challenge um uh, and and the opportunity is to look at the experience over the last two or three months where we've seen um you know the the technology become ubiquitous in the way that we connect with people and the way that business as usual has been maintained in many sectors and look at how that applies across communities and that will be involvement uh, with local authorities and LEPs in terms of you know how they actually invest and what sort of infrastructure they put in place to find um, you know incentives to to get people into you know development of businesses in local communities businesses that will need to replace some of the jobs that will obviously be lost. And there's a great opportunity here to find um, new sources of economic activity in this country. And we will be looking to work with local authorities. What we've done at this point is try to create grants, loans, um, and um, you know, incentives for investment that actually uh, help people to survive. Um, but what we've also got to do is be ambitious going forward. So, you know, we will be looking at that. And that's something that, you know, again, not always appropriate to have a rollout nationally, but we'll be working with um, uh, devolved administrations, with metro mayors, um, with large local authorities uh, to, you know, find ways of, of helping people you know, develop new business propositions. And, and to talk, um, so... We, we know that there's going to be something coming up. Um, one of the things we do at Codec is try and um, collect as much information from the community as possible and transmit that to government and engage with you guys on, on what, what, what are the sort of helpful, what are the topics that you're thinking about where it would be useful to have input from the community? You know, what, what kind of ideas are you looking for and how, how can the, the people on this call best communicate through us or, or directly or whatever with the government on this is what a recovery looks like in, in, in the mind of you know, yourself and the Chancellor? Well, I think perhaps sometimes we need to think about, you know, what the outcomes we're driving for. What, what, where do we see things working really well globally and how do we get there? And what sort of incentives do we need to uh, you know, supplement or uh, retain or, uh, or, you know, develop further? Um, and actually have an economic rationale for that. Um, you know, as a government minister, you know, when I look at policy options, I've got to decide what the net effect is likely to be you know it's not just a shopping list it's a shopping list to for outcomes so i think what i'd like to understand is you know when in interventions are suggested you know what would be the effect so that i can then justify it in a competitive situation for um you know choices that obviously ministers make across government so 
you know, where are things working well? What more do we need to do? Why? And what outcome in terms of jobs, skills and, and um, you know, economic effects will, would that deliver? That's the way to frame it. And, you know, I'm always receptive to interventions that can be done on that. And, you know, I, I, I and to move as quickly as possible. And I know the Chancellor would support me in that. And, and what, what, what are we looking at in terms of time frame, John? I know this is the worst question in the world to, to ask a politician, but- You always try though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, well, I've got to, right? This is, this is my job. And, and you say in due course, and then we move on, right? That's, that's usually how this, how this works. Well, what, what there, is there, it? There are, yeah. No, there sorry, are some no. things that we, we need to do um, you know, more quickly than others. I mean, we've, we've got the uh, you know, fiscal event, a budget, which is, you know, will, will be announced in, in due course, but, um, you know, there are things that we can do outside of that cycle all the time. And so, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at what we need to do. Look, we're obviously seeing a massive change to the profile of employment and, you know, supporting human capital is our, you know, our absolute priority. We want to be able to help uh, save jobs, but also help people develop the skills to uh, get into new jobs and that's I think an enduring driver of government activity in the, the hot, top priority in the short term and obviously we've got infrastructure investments that were you know significantly um, you know uh, trailed and, and announced across the country in the budget you know making those happen quickly and bringing forward those is obviously also something that you know we'll be looking carefully at how we can do that safely and, and swiftly. Um, you, you talked a little bit there about uh, about the sort of idea of spurring entrepreneurship, and I think that's one thing that in the tech sector we know um, actually. If you look at the the sort of two thousand eight uh, financial crisis, like we know that a lot of the fintech boom that came in the UK that's been so successful, and you've been overseeing in your role as city minister, uh, has been uh, was as a result of that of that crisis, and, and bluntly, a bunch of people in the city getting laid off and then having to find something else to do. Like, given we know that there are going to be economic challenges to come, do you think that idea of government playing a role in spurring that entrepreneurship uh, is important? And what and what do you guys envisage that could look like? Well, I mean, I think the sort of Tech Force 19 efforts have, have been welcome and very, you know, I mean, really incredible to watch. And we need to look at more and what more things we can do. Um, we've got to make interventions across sectors and um, make them work together. You know, uh, tech businesses are often enablers of innovation in other sectors as well. And, you know, I was, you know, at, at um, Accenture, you know, in the dot com boom in the late 90s and the interesting thing was applying some of those technologies you know in my case at the time to the you know upstream oil industry and i think you know what we're seeing now is some of the um you know the the the, the innovations in in our tech sector how do they apply how do they create productivity uh, uh, enhancements in other industries those are the sorts of things where we need to think about linkages and how government can facilitate and incentivize those and, and we know that, um, you know, sort of we're now pivoting towards a conversation about the future, but there are still lots of challenges in the present. It's like, is the government still looking through at the potential gaps in the support that exists at the moment and thinking about that as it, as it looks forward at future packages? Yeah, I mean, what's guided us is the swift implementation to as many people as possible. And, you know, I'm obviously familiar with the criticisms of where there are gaps, um, but partly some of that is about actually you know the the degree of um assurance that we have over fraud and also the you know the economic situation of those that you know we we can and can't help and you know that's made you know things tough and also designing in many cases the infrastructure behind an intervention from scratch you know that is not something that you know although you know colleagues in government have done a fantastic job to get the you know the self-employed support scheme and the furlough scheme up and running in literally record time um you know we the chancellor was always clear from his very first announcements back in march that we weren't going to be able to help everyone and save every job we continue to look at interventions that are needed and obviously as the recovery phase evolves there are different challenges based on the you know the social distancing imperative that has to continue to guide the, the re rehabilitation of our society and, and economy um no i must say uh 
our experience actually, and John and I have spoken about this before, but the, um, that was the progress made with other packages when it came to startups in other countries might have been very rapid to announcement, but actually what we've seen, and I was on a call with my European counterparts yesterday, was that not that many of them have received checks so far. <laughs> um, and so actually it's encouraging to see that some of the, the, the structures that have been put in place by the British government have delivered the outcome, which is ultimately the, the, the main priority. Mm. If they might not have come, the announcement might have not have come at the same pace. That was probably because some of the, the back office work was being done that was required in the end to, to deliver the, the solution. So thanks so much for that. Um, John, I know you've got to go, but is there anything else you want to add that we haven't, we haven't talked about? And I suppose, you know, you should, you should definitely give a plug to the fund for sure. Like I know one of the things we're trying mm. to do is make sure as many people can access it as possible and many people apply mm. as possible, right? Well, I mean, we've tried to listen carefully to the industry and, you know, I think you know, we've had a number of calls, Tom, as you mentioned, you know, talking about, you know, the EIS challenge, thinking about, you know, the, the thresholds, thinking about the diversity issue, you know, thinking about how we enable this to make sure you know, angel investors, VCs and, and, you know, sophisticated investors can all access the platform. You know, I, you know, we certainly haven't got everything right, but we are, you know, in listening mode. And I know my officials engage very closely with you and colleagues across um, the, the sector. So we'll continue to drive forward. We'll keep things under review. We'll take on board the issue around, you know, data and how we present this uh, and how we develop, you know, bespoke interventions and also the wider challenge. So I don't think I've got anything new to say, but I just want to you know, reiterate our commitment to continue to listen to the sector, to you know, make sure that the interventions we make are well calibrated, that meet with expectations and actually drive the economic outcome that we're all looking for, which is to continue a leadership role in this sector globally um, and to address the gaps and challenges that you're seeing as a consequence of the, the challenges of this, of this episode in our history. Well, I really appreciate it, John. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. And I know that you've got an awful lot of work to still be doing. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll leave you to it and, uh, and we'll turn to the rest of our panel. Thanks, thanks very much, John. Thanks a lot, bye. Um, so amazing. Thanks very much for that, John. Uh, I want to turn to the rest of our panel now and talk a little bit more. I know there's a bunch of questions that I've already seen that are coming in. And, and when we're delving into that level of detail, we have an awesome panel here to talk about that level of detail. Um, so I should just go through and introduce everyone. So first of all, we have Elizabeth Barley, who's the, the founder and CEO of Tech Hub which is the, uh, as, as uh, you'll forgive me a plug, the, the place where Codec is based. So is the, you know, the most awesome tech community in, in London. Uh, we have Ken Cooper, who's the head of venture solutions at the British Business Bank and has been doing a lot of the running on, on the Future Fund and has been doing some fabulous work. We have Priya Guha, who has a million different hats, I think it's fair to say, but is here today in her, in her capacity as a, a member of the Council of Innovate UK. And we have Mark Brown, who works on future sectors at Bayes and is very much a, a future forward-looking person who has spent an awful lot of time working with the community on this range of issues. I wanted to turn to you first, Elizabeth, um, and just talk a little bit about, like, what are you seeing? What are, what are the startups you guys work with uh, experiencing? And hopefully that'll set a little bit of the scene for, for the conversation to come, but how are they experiencing this crisis? I think uh, one of the biggest challenges, particularly around the um, package that the government's put together, is for those who haven't raised funds or haven't raised the level of funds um, that is required uh, for the future fund. Uh, when I was tweeting about the event this morning, uh, someone responded to me saying, it's really for scale-ups, it's not really for startups. And so I think that's um, the challenge for some of the earlier stage companies, particularly for those who are choosing to bootstrap. Obviously, we're, we're always uh, a big proponent of uh, focusing on revenue. Uh, don't take money until, until you absolutely need it. Obviously, uh, now is the time that you might absolutely need it. But if it's more difficult to uh, get access to funding, either through the Future Fund or uh, general on general commercial levels, that's um, that's a challenge. Uh, uh, where particularly the the loans, the the business interruption loan scheme may also not help. I think that um, the furlough scheme has been super useful uh, for a lot of people, but one of the things that wasn't implemented around that, for example, which is due to be implemented, is the idea of part time. Uh, 
team members uh, where if you're a small organization you may have had your revenue drop your large uh, customers uh, disappear but you could actually have your team working so that you could um, come out of this situation in uh, not a better position but in in a less worse uh, position and so that has been something I think that's been quite challenging for some people who've been furloughing stuff. That's, that's really interesting. Mark I wondered whether I could come to you next quickly because one, one of the things that um, Elizabeth raises there is you know, we know that there are um, a bunch of companies that aren't able to access the, the, the future fund because they haven't raised the 250,000 uh, pounds. Um, obviously, there's the Innovate stuff, which I'm sure Priya will touch on in a minute. But I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the small business grant scheme and, and exactly how that's structured and what, what, where companies go for that. Because I think that's one of the sort of less publicized, to be honest, aspects of, of what's out there and actually is the one that's probably most applicable to a bunch of, bunch of companies on this call. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Dom. So the the uh, if, I, if I understand the the thing that you're referring to, the one that this is by local authority. Oh, I think you're cutting out a bit there, Mark. Have we? So just to check, that I'm answering the right question. You're talking about the uh, the scheme being administered by the local by local authorities. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, as I said, it's, it's that gone out from MHCLG to not being administered by local, by local authorities, MHCLG to um, upper tier local authorities, um, and uh, really the mean local authority. Um, so, your, you know, your London Borough or your upper tier local authority, sort of gov.uk, have, have a look on their, web, their website. Um, so, something I think that's been really helpful around that scheme is, is some of the guidance that's gone out underlining the importance of um, uh, co-working spaces, for example, which I mentioned earlier. So I think that's, I think that's pretty positive. Um, and we have some of your colleagues in the sector to thank for really underlining the importance there. Um, and I think also, Dom, you've been doing some work with some of the, uh, some of the boroughs that, that are really the bigger players in this space in that they have the largest startup communities. And I'm sure that will be helpful in preparing the ground when, uh, people on the call make, make those approaches to their local authorities? So, yeah, so the basic answer to that question is the local authorities are going to deliver these grants and uh, there's going to be a wide variety, I think it's fair to say, of different ways in which that will be accessible, but ultimately it will be up to your local council. So for the startups on the call, it's really, really important that you keep an eye on what your local authority is doing because ultimately they're going to be the ones that are, that are delivering this potential support, which is, which is you know, a potentially a crucial, a crucial lifeline. Um, Priya, I wanted to turn to you quickly. Um, and we, we sort of, the minister had mentioned briefly the, the different sort of pots of money that Innovate potentially has as part of this crisis. Why don't you walk through that a little bit again and, and, and talk a little bit more about what the process is going to be, what's out there already, what we're still waiting for and, and what's to come. Um, absolutely delighted to. So um, Innovate was able to uh, secure about £750 million pounds as part of the startup support package, and that was split across a number of areas. As the Economic Secretary talked about in his remarks earlier, some of that was designed to support people who were already in receipt of Innovate UK government support in order to make sure that their projects stayed on track. Um, and then a proportion of that funding has been set aside for new customers, um, new people who haven't historically been um, able to access Innovate UK funding. And I think that was one of the themes that came up on the chat. So just to reinforce that um, there will be an announcement coming shortly to detail how anyone who hasn't historically been a recipient of Innovate UK funding can get access to that. So watch the space. And then the last part of that um, series of measures was actually an increase in business advice support. Um, what we want to be able to do through Innovate UK is strengthen the ability of businesses all over the UK, actually, in particular through regional centres as well, to get access to advice and support of where to go to get the right funding, get the right support for, for their um, COVID related issues, but actually more broadly for um, questions and advice about how to scale. 
So it's a sort of broad swathe of measures, but I think, you know, just for the benefit of those who um, haven't historically accessed Innovate UK funding, there will be a new swathe of funding coming out shortly. And please do watch that space for that announcement. So, so I guess two questions that come out of that, and it's something that I've spoken to startups about a lot. The first is how quickly is quickly, and we'll, we'll leave, you know, I, at the risk of asking the same question I asked the minister why there is no answer. Uh, do you know how quickly that'll be? And the second one is, um, you know, we'd heard an awful lot about the initial COVID rapid response competition, which saw a huge number of applications, and I'm sure there'll be a bunch of startups on this call who put in their application for that in sort of in good faith, I think it's fair to say, and then saw there was 8,000, I think, applications, which is a remarkable testament to the the potential benefits of Innovate's work, but also poses you guys a challenge, um, which is that a bunch of people wouldn't be able to get money through that. It's like, what would you say to those companies that have probably applied for that, probably didn't get very far because there wasn't enough money to go around? Like, what, what is, is, it, is there a chance to look at that, the, the applications for that again? Is that the intention or is it trying to build something that can work potentially for those companies if they reapply? So, you know, the COVID Fast Start project was specifically related to projects of up to 50K, which had something that was directly addressing the societal needs post-COVID or during COVID. So that was a specific um, grant process. And as people may know, if they did apply for that process, um, the grant forms were intentionally slimmed down and the process was um, significantly speeded up to ensure that people found out quickly if they were successful and then were able to start implementing the ideas they had because as we all know there is a real need to start delivering on some of the amazing sort of R&D and innovation ideas that will help us steer the sort of future economic recovery. Any future grants will be geared around um, specific criteria which our intention is to remain broad so that you can see a whole variety of the amazing potential innovations out there being able to secure funding. So it won't be sort of cut and paste from your previous application. Um, I would encourage people to look very carefully at what the details of the next competitions, whatever comes out as part of the startup support and indeed any future competitions that innovate UKRI and other government bodies are running to think about whether their innovation is relevant to that particular competition and if it is um, make sure that they're gearing their application to that particular competition in order to maximize their potential for success but the reality is Dom you know there are there were as you say you know 8,500 applications for that COVID fast grant competition and, and 800 companies were able to receive funding um, but, you know, there will continue to be new funding calls announced. We should make sure that everybody um, in this community, everyone who's on the call now, please do keep an eye on what's coming out. And if you or no, you, you're, you and your own business or others in your network have potential solutions that are relevant, you know, please do encourage people to apply. This, intent, this is intended to be really focused on those amazing R&D innovation solutions that will get us out as the UK of the economic hit that we've seen as a result of the COVID pandemic. That's really, really helpful. Um, Ken, I wanted to turn to, uh, to you quickly. Um, what uh, we saw the data come out yesterday, I think for the first time on the, the sort of distribution of the money from the future fund, which is very exciting. And, you know, I know for, for, for Ken especially, who's been working on this doggedly for, for, for two months, uh, it must be a, te it's a testament to, uh, to all the work that the BBB has done. Um, but Ken, could you just talk a little bit about what, what that data shows um, and, and perhaps a little bit about the process for the Future Fund so far and what you've learned, you know, over, not just over the past three months, but over the past three weeks since the, since the process opened? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I, I think with, with the the process has, has worked um, remarkably well. Um, it, it, um, feedback is, is generally quite positive. We, we, you know, there, there is a helpline. I, I, I'd urge anyone with questions to call that. They, they're very proficient at answering those questions. Um, I think we, we set ourselves a, a, a target of, of, of um, having loans out the door within 21 days. Um, uh, and to, to an extent we've met that 
um, what's probably very useful is, is the opportunity to sort of set out some reasons why the process might take a little bit longer than that. And um, unsurprisingly, it's, it's a little bit about doing your homework before you make an application. So um, the, the, the process is, is very automated. The, the, um, the portal is quite slick. But what the portal does is it, it triggers requests for information. And, and so those proposals that go through quicker are those ones where information is, is provided quickly. So I think the, the number one thing that's slowing down applications is where people apply on behalf of a group of investors, um, but don't have the details of those other investors. So they're, they're not able to provide um, things like the date of birth because we, we need that for um, money laundering checks. Um, other than that, it, I, you know, it's, it's progressing quite well. It is a very automated system. So um, I actually have daily calls, um, uh, case clinics, as, as, as we call them, um, because it's, I mean, it's amazing the, the sort of issues that can come up. But, but on the whole, I think it's going well, and we're going to see activity actually ramping up quite well as, as we go forward. Um, and that's really helpful to hear, Ken. And um, a quick question. So, you know, I asked the minister a little bit about this, but I thought I'd follow up with you. Like in terms of the data that will come out of this, you know, like who is getting this money? What can we expect to see from the BBB publicly that, you know, because I, like, like I said, I know that this is one of the really important questions that we're seeing, particularly in the context of the past two weeks. Um, but, you know, it's certainly been a question from the very beginning for a range of us around who is going to be able to access the fund. And so are we going to see more detailed information come out on that in due course? Yes. Um, I, I, the intention is, is to, to publish that data around about the 22nd of June. Um, I, I've, I've given you a date because I didn't want to just say in due course, but that, that's the intention. <laughs> a, a lot of that will depend on how clean that data is. So, and that, that data will include um, all, all the, the diversity and inclusion stats, including in fact, in this one, you know, where, how we are in a, on a regional spread. But I think as, as the minister said, you know, this, this, the nature of this program is, is that we really we expect it to follow um, follow what's happening in the wider market. So uh, yeah, that, that's the sort of data we expect to see. Um, we, I, I know because I, I checked before coming on that we, we have all of the regions covered um, and, and that most of the data in, in its raw form looks like that is exactly what's going to happen. It, it will reflect the wider market. Priya, I wonder whether you wanted to talk a little bit about um, about the innovate side and and how how is the tracking and understanding of of who's getting that money? What does what does that look like going forward? It is you know absolutely fundamental that we track where this money is going. Um, as as you know, Dom and some others on the call probably know. You know, I've been um, a strong advocate from a community perspective. You know, with, with my personal hat on um, about the importance of seeing where such a big intervention as this sort of 1.25 um, goes in the UK tech ecosystem and potentially for using it as a lever for good to do um, what needs to happen in the tech sector, which is improve our ability to bring in fund and support underrepresented founders across the board. Um, we've talked about that in the context of gender. We've talked about in the context of regional representation. It's also absolutely fundamental to do that in the context of representation of black and minority communities in the UK. Um, it is really shocking that we still don't have accurate information across the board about how much funding, for example, goes to black and minority ethnic led businesses and actually um, Tom Adeyula, who happens to be on the call today, is driving forward a really great effort to get this on the radar and try and get the data that we need to um, make sure that we are redressing what is a very obvious gap in the system. Um, from an Innovate perspective, we are doing a number of things. Um, firstly, you know, we are making sure that our data is right. Um, we know through work we've done historically, for example, through women in innovation programs, that when you start to focus on this as an issue, it really changes the, the openness of your competition for people from underrepresented groups. So just to give you an example, Innovate have seen a 70% increase 
in women-led applications since we started our Women in Innovation program. So that's just a great example of actually when you start talking about this, when you start focusing on it, it really makes a difference in terms of the people who are applying. We've also seen in the, in the COVID-19 fast grant competition, a strong correlation between the diversity of a leadership team in terms of gender and the success of that company in the competition. So, you know, it is both the right thing to do from an inclusion perspective, but this is more than that. This is about if we want the best sort of economic recovery for the UK, we need to be making sure that our innovations are diverse and the teams leading those innovations are diverse, both because it's the right thing to do, but also because the innovation will be better and those businesses will perform better economically and contribute better to the UK's economic recovery. McKinsey have just updated their latest diversity reporting, and that shows that if you have a diverse um, leadership team by gender, the business performs better by 25%. If you have a diverse leadership team by um, minority representation, you get a 36% better performance by that business. So it is an absolute no brainer, in my view, for any sort of government funding to be focused on how to ensure it is being uh, distributed in a diverse and inclusive way to ensure that the business is performing better, both for itself in terms of financial performance, but for society, because it will be inclusive. Absolutely, 100%. Um, and, and just thinking about, uh, Mark, I wanted to turn to you quickly, just thinking about the, um, so we know that this is, this is roughly what's on the table right now. We've walked through all the different options and I know there was a conversation in the chat, Steve uh, was asking, you know, there's so much going on where, what is the right thing for me? How do we know? And actually that's something that we're working on at the moment is co Codec is a really simple one pager of the core scheme so that people can see what, what are the appropriate options for you. Um, but Mark, I wanted to talk a little bit, um, if, we've, if we've still got Mark, he might have disappeared, um, about what, um, what the, uh, the future looked like and what potential, what comes next in many ways. Um, Mark, I don't know if you're still there or I can't. I yeah, can't, I'm. I'm. Oh, I'm you're here. Just, I'm you're here, just John. On, you're just off video. Fantastic. So, so what, um, Mark? Do you want to talk a little bit about um, about what comes next in terms of you know the minister mentioned a fiscal event, but obviously there's going to be a big conversation going on about recovery now. We've seen that. Uh, I know we talked about this yesterday, but Bayes is convening panels at the moment on what recovery could look like for the startup ecosystem. So what, what do you think the priorities are going to be moving forward? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dom. Really helpful. Yeah, so I'm on, I'm on audio. Steve Garvey suggested I turn off the video, which I think was probably a comment about my uh, lockdown haircut. But anyway, <laughs> I hope you can all hear me. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think there's sort of two ways to, to, to think about this. These are the conversations I'm having with uh, people uh, in, in Bayes. There's the big picture, future, long-term strategy stuff. And kind of ministers are really clear. We heard uh, John Glenn say this, but um, Alex Sharma and, and the Bayes ministers are really clear about a tech-led recovery, like the absolute critical importance of, of tech to our long-term economic um, uh, prosperity and, and startup culture, innovation culture as part of that. So there's some kind of big ticket items coming down the tracks, like a new R&D strategy. And uh, again, the minister mentioned uh, the, the big uplift in R&D spending announced in the budget. There's a spending review uh, in the autumn. And a lot of my work at the moment is absolutely getting tech, digital tech, startup culture, innovation, entrepreneurship, like right in the center of that. Okay, so that's that's the kind of big picture long-term stuff the more practical crunchy stuff is really about um as you allude to on the secretary of state alex sharma announced earlier in the week these um uh new business-led groups that he's convening and there are set piece round tables for those but that's not by any means the only opportunity to influence one of them is about innovation and r d one of them's about uh how we make the uk the best place to start and scale a business. So those are the, the, the two of the five that are really relevant here. Dom, you and I have already had some conversations about how, you know, what you want to feed in from, from your network. Um, and, and I'm sure you'll, uh, you know, speak to, speak to the network about uh, helping you do that. 
What I would say there is what ministers are after is some practical, crunchy suggestions. They want the specifics. They want to be told what's required. OK, um, and I think it's also helpful just to have in mind that there, you know, whether you think about this as medium term and long term or, or you know, fixing the roof and then, you know, tending to the foundations or, or, or whatever, um, the two meet in the middle. But there's certainly something about saying, let's look at what the tech scene looks like in, let's say, Manchester, Bristol, Sheffield, Edinburgh. How has that been impacted over the last uh, three months during lockdown? What do we want to do practically right now to, uh, you know, mitigate some of those effects? Yeah. And then there is, I guess, really, I mean, we've done a lot of work on this over the last uh, nine months on our, on our tech competitiveness study. There's pretty clear sort of structural issues out there, which we know about, you know, the diversity issues we've been talking about, obviously key to that, the sort of the pipeline of, of early stage firms coming through, the availability of finance uh, outside of London, all those issues are still there, you know, they've been exacerbated or they've been, um, had a light shone on them perhaps by COVID, but, but we know they're there, they haven't gone away. And it's about understanding what we want to do in the sort of the medium to longer term to get back into those uh, th those those well understood well well understood well recognised issues. I'll sort of stop there because I don't want to rattle on. But the point to make, I guess, is ministers are listening, officials are listening. Now is the time to get that practical advice into us about what uh, people out there in the sector want to tell us is needed. Hope that's helpful, Don. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful, Mark, and, and a fantastic summary of sort of where where we're potentially going. Elizabeth, I wanted to turn to you quickly because um, you know, Mark's talked a little bit about what uh what, you know, being really clear on what we need and, you know, from your perspective, both in terms of you guys as a business, but also, you know, the the kind of businesses that, that operate at Tech Hub, what do you think those priorities should be looking forward on the over the next one to sort of one to two months in terms of government response, but also what comes next over the course of the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, so I think the, the discretionary uh, grants that are coming available, um, administered via councils, I think that's really important. We're hoping to see something this week, which is, um, I think, you know, we're, we're about five weeks after the announcement at the moment. So I know a lot of people have been really hanging out uh, for the advice on, on how to apply and, and the ability to apply. Um, that helps to uh, address um, the issue for companies that are in co-working spaces in communities like ours who haven't been able to access the um, the, the earlier grant uh, administered by councils so that is um, that's really important and and as you were saying Dom earlier the, the the checks being written really quickly that that money being sent really quickly is really essential because particularly when you're a small company and you still have uh, bills to pay, you still have uh, costs going out. Um, there's only so much time you can hang on. Uh, and so we really need to see that uh, element to, to, to really come to the fore, to really support those various early stage companies. Um, you asked Dom about how that's, that's affecting us. We have so many um, of our members, uh, obviously we have, we have loads of members who, who use um, our business growth program, uh, who participate in that, who aren't based with us permanently. We also have a workspace attached to what we do. Uh, those companies who have small offices um, are desperate to stay as part of the community uh, because of the value that they get from it but are finding that they're unable to do so because of um, because everybody's having to, to try and cost cut at the moment. So this kind of money coming from the council will make a huge difference both to them and to organisations like ours um, that are not big property companies, that are not um, uh, funded uh, externally by, by investment uh, and want to be able to continue supporting that community provide um, all sorts of programming uh, like this, like like all sorts of things, investor introductions, all of that stuff. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm concerned that we will end up seeing, as you said, Dom, lots of these support organisations 
uh, going to the wall because they just um, they just can't continue. So one of the challenges that we're we're hearing. Uh, uh, both from Hackney uh, Council and directly from Islington, who, who we've been in touch with on a number of occasions, is that they're only being given a relatively small amount of money um, to distribute uh, under that programme. So they've received £3 million pounds each, uh, but given that um, Hackney and Islington are such high concentrations um, of, of startups and early stage companies, um, it would be really interesting to know if that sort of funding level is going to be reviewed based on need once that uh, once that three million has has already been distributed or as the applications are coming in, because that's one of the biggest challenges that we're finding. Uh, at the moment, both as an organization, but also for our, um, our members, they're saying we, we want to be able to see our teammates in the office when when we're able to we want to be able to be physically together because it makes a measurable difference to our company uh, and to the acceleration of um of of our our product of our revenue of our hiring um it affects jobs uh and so we really want to see that kind of support uh, continuing going forward and support for organizations like ours and many others um, that are in the community uh, that provide that vital support to early stage and scale up businesses. That's really, really helpful and uh, food for thought, certainly, Elizabeth. Um, I wanted to turn to questions a little bit because uh, I know we've had a bunch of stuff coming in on the both on the chat and also we've had a, a sort of a whole range of uh, questions beforehand from a, from a bunch of startups. Uh, I thought I'd start with some specific stuff on the fund, Ken, if that's okay, because um, I know there's sort of a couple of questions. I think the the one that's been repeated a couple of times, um, and and feel free to direct people to the support if if um, if you're not best placed to answer this. But but what does you know we're we're hearing that that applications are under review. Can you talk a little bit about what under review looks like? I know obviously there's going to be a challenge of. Um, what's the polite way of putting this, that all the money is going to be used up <laughs> and that, you know, we're having conversations with Treasury about that. And uh, I know that John has previously said that uh, that's kept under review, but, but what, what in terms of the application process, if a bunch of people is hearing that, that they're still being looked at, what does that, what does that mean for them? Okay. Well, Don, that, that could mean a, a number of things um, ranging from there's been an issue with, with um, some of the KYC checks um, to, to um, you know, there was a lot of, of confusion about connected investors, and, and in some cases, people um, people have included connected investors in their matched funding. This is in the in the, a very narrow definition of connected investors, which is which is investors that own more than fifty percent of the company, um, and and they can't be part of the matched funding. So some of those, there's there's a bit of it. Um, bit of work going on to, to try and understand what's going on behind that. There are others that have um, investment from a, a fund that has um, other government investment in. And now that's not excluded, but we have to run some checks on the nature of that fund to make sure that it is compatible with the, the, the sort of state aid position of, of the future fund. I, I think though the, um, there, there, there is a, uh, we are, I think pregnant with an announcement, um, um, but it's one for Treasury uh, on on what happens uh, around budget. But, you um, announce I'm, government policy, Ken. Is that not how this works? Uh, it? It's not how it works. <laughs> no, um, but but you know, I would say that as 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 British Business Bank and 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 the Future Fund itself, um, my expectation is that um, it would stop taking applications um, if those applications did not have a chance of being funded. So, I, you know, I think um, we, we are seeing people that have, for example, changed their investor mix on the way through. Um, and unfortunately, because it's a very automated system, they kind of have to go back to the start. And I know that people are, are, are getting upset about that because they think, you know, it was first come, first served. I'm now at the back of that queue and I'm not going to get money. That That isn't the case at the moment. So, you know, should that change, I think there will be some... some um, some PR around that. 
Yeah, and so and so then I can just check because I think this is the message that we've certainly been delivering to startups, but but absolutely people should continue to put in applications for the fund, if only because I think from your perspective and from the government's perspective, it's helpful to see the demand, right? In order to be able to appropriately judge whether or not expansion is necessary or indeed, you know, what level of expansion is necessary. The the ability to continue to see that people want the fund is going to be important to to make that case in many ways for, for additional capital. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and actually, you know, the, the, the numbers, um, as, as it moves through, we're not seeing a great deal of dropout, but we have seen, for example, duplicate applications, which, which tend to, to bounce the numbers higher. So, so there is a process of running it through, getting some CLNs issued. Um, there's there's a, a bit of delay then comes there where people have to actually get money into bank accounts and things before, before the, the cash flows out the door. But um, at the moment, it's if if somebody has a problem that means they have to go back to the start, that that's not the end of of the application. That that would still work quite well. I I wonder, Dom. I'm not sure which which other questions you're going to ask me, but um, I thought I thought I might just get in a plug for the um, the other things that the, the British Business Bank Please does, do. because we've been talking about support, um, and actually we're we're. We're continuing to run our enterprise capital fund program. We have regional funds that are out there and investing. Um, we've just put an extra 30 million into the Angel Co Fund. Um, all of those are, are able, um, or many of our enterprise capital funds are, are able to, to back companies that haven't had that 250,000 of, of equity before. Um, and that includes with, with the Angel Co Fund. Uh, they're not quite such big numbers as we're seeing with the COVID schemes, but all of that support that, that's been out there before is is still out there. I'd also like to to, to echo a little bit some of the stuff Priya said on the diversity. It, it is very key for us and on our ongoing programs, you know, people don't get funded by us and, unless they've got a commitment to diversity. So you know, that, that's something that we've, we've actually been doing for some time now. And as for the economic case, we're, we're absolutely behind that. And, and our last but one enterprise capital fund actually has an investment thesis of seeking out underrepresented groups because um, we believe, like many other people do, that we're, we're going to make outsized returns on that. So absolutely. Um, back to the future fund. Sorry, Don. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. I, I mean, I just had one more question before I move on. But, but you know, we talked a little bit. Just I'll give you another chance to plug. Where do people go for information? So those very specific questions... How do they access the kind of support on, you know, my applications under review? What does this mean? I have a specific question about that. What, wh who should they be emailing? Who should they be chasing? Hopefully not you. I think is a basic answer. I'm sure. Please, where, please where, not me. Yeah, not, yeah. not with those numbers. <laughs> which, um, which, the, which email address do you want to give out? <laughs> basically, Ken is the question. <laughs> there, there is, um, I, the, the Future Fund website has, has the, the, the contact details. There are, um, there are lots of people there answering phones who are, are well trained on these things. The, the process, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I think they probably quite like it if they get a really difficult question because then, then we get to have a case clinic about it. Um, uh, and, and actually, the, uh, they are perhaps a little bit clunky, but there's a lot of frequently asked questions, um, you know, set out as for investors, for companies, for solicitors. It really is worth having a look at those um, because. You know, the, the, they don't mind at the help desk, but they are they are often asked questions that are already covered in those in those FAQs. Absolutely, and I just posted the link to the support desk in the chat. If anyone needs to use that, do do go ahead and and do so. Um, Priya, we've had a, a bunch of questions about about innovate, but I, I just one of the things that I wanted to um, touch on a little bit was, you know there's been an awful lot of sort of conversation about potential bits and bobs. I think one of the key questions that it seems to me a lot of people have is if you don't have innovate money at the moment and, you know, we know that there'll be new programs coming, but so what, what exactly do we think will be for those people who haven't got innovate capital so far? And, you know, cause presumably a lot of the people who do will know roughly what the channels will look like. And then I saw the second question, which is, what can they be doing if they're in that position, you know, where we might, there might be programs that are coming or programs that exist um, to be preparing to put in applications and stuff. You know, what's the, what's the things founders need to, to, to be doing really? Yeah, I guess, you know, the starting point is to, to be clear that Innovate UK funding is not for every startup. Yeah. Innovate UK funding is targeted specifically at sort of, you know, R&D, 
innovation heavy businesses, uh, large and small. And um, I think the first thing to for businesses to think about is, is that the right model for what you are doing in your business? And um, if it's not, then what are the other sources of support you can get from the ecosystem? You know, we've talked about fantastic sort of, you know, peer group support that you get from being in communities like um, uh, what Elizabeth and the team are doing at Tech Hub and you've experienced it directly, Dom, um, as Codec is based there. Um, the broader UK ecosystem across tech is, is, is an amazing um, support community and I would just encourage everybody to use that as a means of understanding what's right for your business. You know, if you think that Innovate UK is going to be the right place for you to get funding for your R&D intensive business as you scale, then you know there the will be competitions announced you should track those and understand you know which one of those is best suited to what you're trying to do and um, talk to people who have received funding in the past talk to people at the knowledge transfer network who are there to support businesses as they apply dial into the webinars that innovate uk, UK run for new customers to understand how the process operates. Um, Innovate have a swathe of measures there that are designed to try and make the process as transparent as possible. So use those, don't apply blind, and make sure that you know, you're giving yourself the best chance of success as you apply for one of those competitions. But please don't lose sight, as I said at the beginning, of the other types of support that are out there for you. Uh, it is always, I think, an, a, an amazing thing to experience, uh, which is the, you know, the community support that there is in UK tech. So use that, use your network, use your peer groups, find out all of the types of things that can help you scale your business and use them. That's a really helpful reminder. And, and I think like it does spring to mind certainly the point around um, you know what works for Innovate UK. What are the things that Innovate UK funds? One of the things we've been trying to get across really clearly to the community is you know which funding pots are appropriate for who, and 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 where the potential gaps are. And we know there are some gaps, but actually like you know making sure that people are putting in for for the right kind of support. Um, Elizabeth, I wanted to talk a little bit about that sort of community support because I know you guys have been publicizing some of the, the schemes that are out there that are sort of not, you know, we talked an awful lot about what government support is out there, um, but what other support do you guys see um, people in the community accessing? Not, not just the kind of the softer support, but I know there are some funding, funding pots the old, you guys have sort of been involved in promoting as well. Yeah, so we, um, we always uh, run every week um, investor meetings uh, for our members and that hasn't stopped um, just because they're not in in person meetings anymore. So we have um, opportunities weekly to meet investors who are actively investing now, who are actively looking at new investments now. I know a lot of people have gone to uh, investors or investors they were having conversations with and been knocked back because those investors are focusing on making sure that their uh, current portfolio um, uh, have enough money to keep going etc so we are um, making sure that for, for all of the investor meetings that we're arranging that they are actively investing and um, and ready to meet new companies so that's been one of the, the hugely um, uh, valuable things that we offer uh, that, that people are still uh, able to access. Um, we also run um, a, a load of different elements uh, to our programming to support around things like, uh, so for example, we've got a session with Deloitte um, coming up later today that's around how you can, you know, how, how do you get through uh, this kind of situation with, um, you know, for, from a financial perspective? And so it's, I think it's really important to recognize that, yes, it's not business as usual, but at the same time, there are elements of uh, your business that you have to keep um, operating, you have to keep running. And so making sure that you're accessing those kinds of support sessions are really important just to get that free advice from 
uh, from incredible organizations that you that might be challenging for you to access uh, financially uh, in other ways and that's why we we make so uh, much of our programming available to to everyone not just to our members because you need that uh, support right from the beginning uh, we also uh, sent something out um, just this week around a program that Barclays uh, is running at the moment to um, to to offer grants uh, and making sure that that you know small amounts of money uh, are going out to uh, to those very early stage businesses that one uh, I know you have to be have been in business for at least 12 months but aside from that there's no investment criteria uh, etc but it's a small amount of money but for early stage companies a small amount of money can make an absolutely massive difference uh, at a time like this so it's um, uh, as I posted in the chat it's worth signing up to our uh, newsletter and following us on Twitter um, just to to hear about those things as they're coming out because we share everything that we hear about not just things from our own community uh, or from our own programming that we're running and not just government um, programs we, we share everything that we hear that could be useful to um, to early stage and scale ups absolutely Priya I know you wanted to jump in quickly yeah, I think it's just um, a point that's worth building on in terms of the context of, of community. And it's, you know, it seems a bit of an odd thing to say on a webinar that is about government support for startups during COVID. But we have to, I think, all recognise that the government support for startups, the exceptional type of government support, is, is a, a temporary lifeline. And we as a community need to look at sort of what do we want our businesses and our ecosystem to look like when the government support returns to, you know, the status quo normal. And that, you know, is, of course, a very supportive uh, structure from government to encourage a startup ecosystem. But some of this recovery will have to be driven by us as an ecosystem and by driven by individual founders as they look to steer their businesses and pivot their businesses to be focused on what the sort of new normal will look like. And some of that new normal will be linked to government, but some of it won't be. And I think there's a real opportunity for UK tech to come together in the way that Elizabeth described the community that they operate and are you know, much part, very much part of the broader ecosystem for the community to come together to drive that you know we need to help ourselves alongside um looking at the government for support in this sort of very um exceptional moment in history um and i say that you know with my personal hat on not as you know a member of the innovate uk council um but i just think it's a really important place to think about you know we can steer this recovery as a tech ecosystem. And it's really important that we all come together to do that. Uh, Liz, I know you wanted to add one more thing on that. Yeah, just to, to echo what Priya was saying. Um, one of the things, one of the biggest challenges um, has been uh, the stress on founders, the stress uh, on their teams. And it, it's, dif it's difficult starting and running a business. We all know that this has been an incredibly challenging time one of the things that we find most valuable and that our members tell us a lot is just having other people around you who you can talk to um, about things that are going on, especially people that you can feel comfortable talking to about just how really not fun uh, it can be sometimes. And I think that element um, of the, the mental health um, challenge around the current situation. You know, everyone uh, in, in the world is, is facing uh, issues around um, how to manage uh, their lives, how to manage their work, how to manage their mental health. Um, and having those people around you who can just be like, oh, yes, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about and exactly how frustrating this is or how frustrating uh, something else is or the challenges that you're facing, sharing that load even though it's intangible, can make an extraordinary amount of difference, especially if you're a solo founder. So you don't have someone who's on the inside, as it were, in your company that you can talk to. 
Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. And you know, one of the things that that I certainly experienced uh, in the the kind of immediate aftermath of the government support packages for startups being announced was, I think, uh, I did about ten webinars in a week, and I think in that first week there was understandably a, a lot of founders who were just frustrated and struggling, and you could see, and and it wasn't a, a reflection on whether or not the the packages themselves, however flawed they may be, were, were good or bad. It was a reflection on their frustration that they'd seen this, you know, tidal wave happen to their businesses and it wasn't there wasn't an awful lot they could do about it beyond, you know, beyond fight to 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 help them survive. But I think that's a, a really, really important uh, point to make. Um, Ken, I just wanted to pick up on one very specific point because it's a question that we've had an awful lot and then I'm, I'm going to go to Mark to, to sort of finish up. Um, Ken, one of the questions that we've had a lot about the fund and I think it, it's a more broad um, question about startup support and it's something that uh, at Codec we have written to the European Commission about, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about the role that state aid plays in what support can be offered through the fund. Because like we know that that's been a challenge for EIS and I've uh, bored the ministers to death about this conversation as well previously. But um, I thought you could explain a little bit about from your perspective as you were working on constructing the fund, what the challenges were, but I think that'll also hopefully answer some of the broader questions about the role state aid plays and what support can be offered as a, as a kind of result of that, if that makes sense. Because I know it touches a little bit on, for example, the, the question you answered earlier about which regional funds are able to provide funding and, and things like that as well. Um, so do you, wanna, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I can do, Dom. Stop me if I go too far. I, I, oh, it's I, fine. I, look, I, I, I used to have I'm a, a state aid, aid job. Aid I'm so. ready for the state aid lecture then, go ahead. <laughs> So um, the, the, I, I think it's come up in the comments as well. There, there is an issue about the potentially inadvertent, we don't know who knows the, uh, the mind of the commission, but the, the inclusion of companies in difficulty um, in, in the temporary framework, which made it not very helpful at all for startups. The, the future fund itself is not state aid. So, um, and it's, it's not state aid because the instrument, the, co the convertible loan note, has, has gone through a process of being benchmarked. Um, and in that process, the benchmarking has said, yes, it's a, it's a market economy instrument. So it's not state aid, but, but the advice that, that went on that. So there was no taking it to the commission and the commission having a view. This was, this was very much sort of expert advice provided to the government. But that advice said, um, it's not state aid as it is, but there are certain things you have to watch out for. Um, um, and one of those is um, adverse selection in selecting companies. And, and so because of that, um, there are restrictions on who can be a matched investor. Um, it, it, it isn't so straightforward as a state aid program can't be a matched investor, um, but it's, it's actually a sort of a, a three-way test for, for funds. Uh, they have to be managed by a private sector manager. They have to be incentivized to make profit, so, so some kind of carried interest scheme. Um, and there can't be, can't be any government involvement in, um, in the, the decision-making and there must be some private money in the mix somewhere. That actually allows for a, a wide variety of funds. Um, we, we tested some of the funds we knew best um, as part of that process, which is why we know that enterprise capital funds can provide matched funding. And we know that the, the funds from our, our own regional programs can provide matched funding. Other funds can also apply and we go through the process once uh, and they will either be added to the list of funds that, that are, are kind of green lighted or um, individual investments may be green lighted depending on their structure. In, in fact, depending on whether they have private investment in their structure or, or whether they rely on co-investment. So the, the EIS and VCT points are, are unfortunately rather different because whilst they would meet that, those criteria, their own rules, I believe, um, mean that they would lose their tax relief. So, um, so it, it is very hard for an EIS fund or a VCT fund to provide that matched funding um, because the, the CLN itself would not meet their criteria. They are state-aided programs. I think the, um, 
you know, we, you, you mentioned it before, but the, you know, the government were really keen that um, particularly business angel investors could, could provide that match funding for the future fund. We know how important that is um, across, uh, you know, all, all sectors of diversity. The, you know, there tend to be uh, more female and ethnic minority backed businesses that, that perhaps because they have less money um, a, a business angel back to other than fund back. So we were really keen to, to, to make that work. I think um, the government has said that investing in a CLN won't impact the, the previous tax statement of investments, which, you know, is a good thing because otherwise if you, if you are an EIS investor and you, you make a loan to a business, you risk losing the benefits that you've already got. And, and I believe that once the, the, the CLN has converted, future investment could still be EIS eligible. Um, but I, I believe that there, there is still an issue over having the CLN and putting in some EIS money. I, I yeah, don't think that's that still quite works through legally, right, Ken? That's like still a, a bit of a challenge, but but hopefully we'll be we'll be making progress. I wanted to. I'm conscious that we're running over time, Mark. I just wanted to to come to you quickly for a quick thirty seconds of uh, what comes next. What are the big things on the agenda, and how do we, you know, how do startups in this conversation who might have heard a little bit about what supports on offer input into those conversations that we talked about a little bit earlier uh, and and you know keep the keep the energy going apart from anything else uh, yeah sure thanks thanks dom so um I, I described the sort of long-term big picture um you and i are working very closely on that um also with you know the folks at tech nation and tech uk and uh, and on all of those guys uh, please keep using your networks please keep bothering uh, dom and your your sort of other um, uh, sector representatives who, with whom we have those relationships, you know, as I said earlier, give us the practical advice, tell us what's, what's kind of needed right now. Um, I, I, a little reflection I sort of have, I guess, on what it's felt like the last three months. I think there's been some really valuable sort of subtle changing of attitudes amongst some people in, in, in Whitehall, like the agility of the sector and like the literally hundreds of offers that rolled into government in the first week of lockdown, I think did quite a bit to uh, surprise some people and shift some attitudes. Um, there's a fantastic piece of work that ODI and Leeds were leaving, uh, leading, hashtag open data saves lives. The benefits of opening up data in a crisis like uh, we've been experiencing right at the moment that DCMS is developing a new data strategy. You know, little things like that, that perhaps just shift shift perceptions. And, and I think what's really important and what would be helpful uh, for, the, for the sector sort of collectively to communicate is there's a, there's a temptation that we understand this all a bit in a simplistic way, which is, oh, hasn't tech helped us work from home? Or, oh, won't it be great if I've got a lanyard and it beeps if I walk within two meters of my coworker? Actually, tackling COVID and recovery is a bit more sophisticated than that when you think about the potential of uh, tech, fast growing startups to uh, create jobs, uh, build productivity in, in, in the regions and so on. And I think communicating that bigger story is, is really important and really helpful. And, and also uh, people on, on the call throughout have talked about this in one way or another, the importance of ecosystems, of communities, of networks, of the, so the soft relationships, the mentorship, the skills, uh, the talent, the enthusiasm, as well as the cold hard cash, I think is again tremendously useful to, to, to communicate into my colleagues in Whitehall and, and to ministers. That's a really helpful and very optimistic note to end on Mark, I think. <clears throat> One of the, the sort of most striking things about this crisis is that, um, you know, the importance of uh, making sure that whilst we know a lot of these businesses are struggling and, and you know, the, there's important questions to how we allow them to survive through this period, we can certainly see now the value, the value add that they provide to society and the potential benefits from all of the awesome work that the participants on this call are, are doing in their own in their own little verticals. Um, so I'll finish up there. Thank you so much to all our panelists, Elizabeth Varley, Ken Cooper, Priya Guha, and Mark Brown, as well as to the minister from earlier. Thanks so much to everyone for joining, and I hope you'll join us again in the future. You can, uh, I know that the panelists have put some 
details for themselves in the chat. Um, we're at, at Codec on Twitter, or just uh, you can join our newsletter at codec.com. But I really appreciate everyone for joining. Thanks very much and have a good day. Thank you.